Hi, everybody. Hello, um, everyone. We missed you at the university you... for seeing your Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> you've been terribly, ter terribly missed. <laughs> uh, we just wanted to welcome you to truly our first um, our first Zoom uh, lecture. Uh, because it's our first, I just wanted to go through just a few guidelines uh, for everybody. As you can see, everyone is muted right now, including uh, our uh, uh, director who will be taking the, the, the floor in a minute, as well as President Khoury. Uh, you will be muted for the entire session, uh, except at the end, if you will have any questions as stated in the email, uh, you can either raise your hand virtually on Zoom or send us the question on the chat. Uh, other than this, uh, this meeting is recorded. So if you wish not to be recorded, just please stop your video and um, you will not be showing. Uh, other than this, I give uh, uh, the floor to our uh, Dean and to our, sorry, to our program manager, Maya, who just, has a word. Just in case you have any technical problems, you can call me, Mira Zatari. She's there to support you technically. Exactly. Now we give it to, to uh, uh, Abla to introduce President Khoury. Good morning, everyone. Good, good afternoon. Okay. I, also, I miss you. And uh, thank you for joining us in the first session of the University for Seniors program for this fall 2020. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Abla Sibai. I'm the co-founding director of the University for Seniors program. And I have recently assumed the role of the interim dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the UB. Uh, it's indeed our honor and pleasure to have with us today Dr. Fadlo Khoury, the president of the American University of Beirut, sharing with us his insights and reimagining the long road home. A bit of context before I introduce you, President Khoury, I know you are, you know, you are Asham and Ta'arraf, just to put the context where we are in the University of Osinia. So the University of Osinia is a lifelong learning program targeting older adults, 50 years and and this marks the 10th anniversary. This presentation is a long-awaited talk that was supposed to be to take place early in March 2020, right before the lockdown. Unfortunately, we had to postpone it on and on until today. The seniors back then had planned to offer you, Mr. President, uh, on stage and in person, a kind of a small donation raised by the UFS and a painting about a UV done by one of our gifted members who is 83 years old, Maram Kweisi. I hope that you are here, Maram. The donation and the painting are real testament for the commitment and the appreciation of our members to the UFS program and to EU. So now back to the introduction. Dr. Fadl Khoury is the 16th and the current president of AUB. He is an accomplished molecular and translational oncologist having authored over 750 publications. He serves as editor-in-chief of the journal Cancer and is the recipient of numerous prestigious international awards. Since assuming the presidency, Dr. Khoury has had obtained many grants, scholarships, donations for underprivileged students and patients totaling over 250 million. Dr. Khoury brought to AUB a new vision for health that takes an all-encompassing approach to, to human health, has introduced several PhD programs, nurtured many startups, cultivated an entrepreneurship ecosystem in Lebanon. He also spearheaded the effort to transform AUB into a fully tobacco-free campus and was awarded the World No Tobacco Day Award for the w, by the WHO. Uh, we thank you, President Khoury, for being such a strong supporter of UFS. You had mentioned it as a stellar program and you label it as the, as the gem on the AUB crown in one of your presidents. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Abla. Thank you for accepting to be interim dean. I really appreciate that. Uh, Madam, thank you. We got your beautiful painting. It's in Markland House. We're trying to figure out as we finalize the repairs post August 4th, where to put it, but it will have pride of place. Uh, I want to thank uh, the University for Seniors uh, for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Abla. Thank you, Amani. Uh, thank you, the wonderful Ms. Shaheen, and welcome back from London after your, uh, your, your training. So uh, thank you, Maya. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I'm gonna try to speak for about 45 minutes um, and then leave it open for questions. We're gonna share the PowerPoint. Okay, share computer settings. And Jed is here to prevent me from 
from from uh, completely blowing this from an IT perspective. Tell me if you can hear me. So can you actually see the pictures of Martin and I or just my PowerPoint? Hopefully just the PowerPoint, great. So I entitled this Reimagining the Long Road Home. I gave a similar talk a year and a half ago at the Harvard Arab Weekend, but I've updated it because a few things have happened since the summer of 20, the spring of 2019. And we need to slot forward. Okay. So here's some of the gross inequities that and the challenges that we face in the Arab world. There are tremendous inequities between and within countries. The population is doubling at the fastest rate in the world other than in Africa. So one of the global south's fastest growing population but it's a bimodal population, a young population, but also an increase in the number of older people. By the various UNDP, UNRWA, and other assays, more than 50% of displaced individuals and refugees globally actually live in the Arab world. There are failing states and then there are fading states and weak health systems with non-uniform application. There's a lack of environmental sustainability and an issue of survival really for the peoples. So here we deal with the dual burden of disease on society and on the individual, which is why I'm very attracted to the model, not only of lifelong learners that the University for Seniors exemplifies, but also to the idea of society as the institutional guarantor of individual health and right. And finally, there's a lack of personal freedom and limited engagement in governance. So let's go back. I need to be able to drive from the keyboard. Uh, this has been a, an interesting decade from December 2010, when a street trader uh, called Muhammad Bouazizi set himself on fire in, in Tunisia to spark the initial protests about poverty. And you can then see that the president of Tunisia flee to Saudi Arabia, mass protests begin. The so-called Arab Spring uh, took off. Uh, many Arab leaders were put under uh, threat. Some left, others did not. But in general, uh, what we've seen is enormous turbulence. And other than in Tunisia and beginning in Algeria and Japan, not a lot of increase in individual freedom or the rights of the peoples. But what we have definitely seen is a tremendous global refugee crisis. 26 million in the MENA region alone displaced persons. And with regard to AUB, we have selected key challenges. The financial model, uh, when we arrived, was very, very dependent on a limited number of revenue streams, tuition and patient fees in a part of the world where individuals are getting poorer in general and where wealth distribution is getting more and more skewed. Our, our medical center at AUB was aging structurally and a private practice culture took root at AUBMC. The undervaluing of the humanities, which is spread throughout academia is pronounced also here. There's a cost for being competitive in the sciences and engineering and AUB has struggled to meet that cost since the late 1970s when sciences and engineering became much, much more expensive. Other universities have sprouted in Lebanon and the re region, which are easier, more affordable, increasingly competitive, not the same quality as AUB, but spending a lot on marketing. And at the same time that we were facing this challenge, more and more of our community and increasingly the world was looking to AUB for leadership. So one of the first things I looked at was how do we redefine our mission, enhance our relevance and ensure our sustainability. So AUB has always been a beacon of, of, of knowledge, of light, of hope spreading throughout the Arab world and the global south, but really the Arab world as one of our principal uh, places of impact where we've led to the creation of so many businesses, had so many leaders, good and bad, and had such tremendous impact on, in so many ways. 
And I'd like to hearken back to the words of Daniel Bliss, who said when he was asked what he was building at, at, at then the Syrian Protestant College, he said, we were not anxious to appear great, but we were anxious to lay foundations upon which greatness could be built. And those are the foundations, frankly, in which my uh, view of the world's honest attempts to come together with a more fair world personally and otherwise are formed. If you look at our AUB graduates and former students, as uh, Robert Kennedy said, more world leaders have been educated at the American University of Beirut than any other institution that he could think of, including Harvard, his own alma mater. So more AUB graduates at the establishment of the United Nations, at the signing of the UN Charter on Human Rights than any other institution, and look wh where they come from. Iran, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, uh, quite a few people, leaders in those institutions coming to write the UN Charter and then the UN Charter on Human Rights. And to write our own family history. My great-grandfather from my father's side was a stonemason who moved from uh, Salhi near Sidon to, to Alay. And uh, that eventually produced my father. From my mother's side, similarly, they, her great-grandfather moved from the north, from Akkar to Beirut. And my father always had a, a saying from Tennyson planted uh, underneath his, the glass on his steel desk. It said, to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. And if you follow the final words of that great poem, it talks about striving and not yielding. Tennyson Ulysses is an older Ulysses. He's not a young man anymore, but he can't wait for that next voyage of knowledge. And as I was raised in the AUB culture, I was raised with the idea that anyone who with great responsibility comes great, and with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, I like it from Spider-Man, but that originally comes from Luke in the Bible, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my long road home, but I hope I'm going to be able to tie it enough to the region and to our shared culture as Arabs, as people of the global south, to make it uh, a little more interesting than just autobiographical. For me, the voyage begins really in Beirut with my parents uh, getting to know each other, their courtship, their marriage. And this is them in the early 1960s. These are my parents, and these are the parents of Lemia, of my wife, in Boston at the same time. So my voyage really goes pre preconception, Beirut, Boston, New Haven, New York, Houston, Atlanta, and to most people's surprise, if not necessarily mine, back to Beirut. It's been an enjoyable voyage with publications in, in high impact journals uh, and in standard textbooks of medicine with technologies, clinical investigation, and uh, other new approaches, but a voyage that while it was enjoyable, it was challenging, it was fruitful, it taught me a golden rule. And the golden rule uh, it was best crystallized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers. Outliers is a book that explains or tries to explain why some individuals excel. And it talks about the 10,000 hour rule. Bill Gates had 10,000 hours working at a computer before he ever even thought of starting his own company. And this in the clinical uh, domain is outliers from a different perspective. And these are patients of mine who've either exceeded the expectations as these three do, uh, each of them significantly exceeding the expected lifestyle, two of whom are alive more than a decade with diseases that had at the time we treated the median lifestyles, median life expectancies of a month, and another individual who lived much shorter than he should have, but who helped us get the first major grant from lung cancer through the Department of Defense, which ultimately gave MD Anderson, Emory, UT Southwestern, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute some $70 million. Uh, but, but this individual, Duffy Wall, taught me that if you don't ask, 
for a grant money and you don't lobby for it, often it's hard to get it. So what that taught me is that human beings teach and learn at extremes. We learn from people who do exceptionally well, from teachers who inspire us exceptionally well, and we also learn from the other extreme, from teachers who don't teach us well or from patients who do much worse than we expect. And I tried to encapsulate that when the Chronicle of Higher Education, not a journal I'd read before joining AUB, asked me, why would you go home to AUB? Why would you uh, upend your academic career? And I explained what it is about this university that makes So for those of you who haven't seen this movie, I recommend it highly. It's called The Motorcycle Diaries. And it's about the journey that Che Guevara, Ernesto Che Guevara took as a young medical student when he took a break from his medical education and he toured uh, South America and got to understand a point that I'll make at the end. But I'm going to say, as a sneak preview, he learned about his identity cultural identity, he learned about his influence, and he learned that there can always be better means of governance. And these are some points that Edward Said uh, makes beautifully in his most controversial book on some level, Out of Place, where he talks about his challenging identity as an Arab and as an American. So to do that, I think we have to understand that life, if you're going to accomplish something, is never easy. And Zah Hadid uh, our uh, alumna and the first woman ever to win the Pritzker Award in architecture once said, if you want an easy life, don't be an architect. And what you're looking at here is a beautiful gleaming picture of Beirut pre-August 4th, a city that's unique, that's captivating, that's enthralling and yet dangerous and now needs to be rebuilt. So what is it that motivates us not just to build and rebuild, to be architects of our destiny and of the lives of others. And I think it's a combination of a number of things. For me, it's a combination of being an optimist, a pessimist, and a realist all at once. And William Ward said it as well as I can think of it. William Ward, the great English writer, once said, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, and the realist adjusts to the sails. And by adjusting the sails, we need a true north, we need a light tower. And for me, AUB and my family has always been that light tower, that uh, true north to look to. So when I was tasked to come back here, honored to come back here by the board, who essentially drafted me off the board after a few months and said, you're going back, I tried to create a vision for the university that could be distilled in a few short sentences. And this is it in a nutshell. One, education should always be a path to a more abundant life, especially at AUB. Second, as a liberal arts university, we needed to have a, and embrace a dual identity as a research university and expand and empower that research mission. The third, you are only as good as the people in your home. So we need to have a better, a fairer, a healthier, and a more sustainable workplace, something that's particularly challenging in these times. And fourth, we need it to be an alma mater for the 21st century. Uh, and that means that our alumni, our seniors, our family are always members of that AUB community. So we got to work on this vision and actualizing it. And you'll see the diversity in this room, not just male, female, but here are Brahim Khouri and Tariq Mitri at a table uh, with uh, Rani Hussain and the wonderful Rabia Shibli, people with very, very different backgrounds, backgrounds as architects and, and uh, planners and reporters and diplomats, all thinking how we as a group, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens could change the world as Margaret Mead indeed said, it is the only thing that ever has. And to do that, you have to think strategically and you have to have different thinking hats. Thomas Edison once said, hell, there are no rules here. We're trying to accomplish something. 
And so we thought of ways we could put on our objective hat at the same time as we put on our intuitive hat, our positive hat and our negative hat, because we need to be logical, cautious, look at problems, risks, and weakness. At the same time, we need to be optimistic to build based on values and advantages. We need to be creative, but process oriented. These are Edward de Bono's six thinking hats. To do that, we need a strategic planning process uh, that is underpinned by the mission, by the vision and the values. So how do we put that together? Well, we started by developing a strategic vision some years ago, uh, and that's really based on five key concepts. And we put it together to say, this is our vital strategic vision. V for valuing our community and sharing our values. I for integrating and innovating in a humanities and technology and purpose-based education. T with regard to transforming the university experience, not just an AUB education, but an AUB experience that can build into a lifelong experience. A for ascendancy of research towards advancing a world-class research agenda. And L is to lift the quality, not only of health and medicine, but the quality of life across the region, a region where less than 5% of people who depart to study abroad for two years, if you exclude the Gulf countries, ever do come back to live and contribute to those societies. So think about that. If you're talking about the Levant, if you're talking about the African Arab countries, you're talking about a set of societies and cultures in which 95%, more than 95%, of those who depart to get graduate education or training or a job come back during their productive years. Realizing that we needed to bring things together, which means the faculties, the centers and the institutes, the administrative units, rep, advancement and the academic support units all orbit around and ultimately connect to vital in a way that can bring people together. So to do that, and I recognize this is from times, and this was developed well before COVID-19, well before forest fires, Thoda, uh, well before COVID-19, the economic crash, and finally the August 4 catastrophe, we aimed for and we continue to aim for when COVID-19 is, is under better management, an AUB campus that is permeable, open, welcoming, highly interactive, but always safe. And by that, I mean not just for seniors and alumni and others, but for young people who will have an opportunity to participate in what is the most beautiful and one of the very few true green spaces in greater Beirut. And to do that, we wanted to make it safe and we launched an effort in 2017 that was completed uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, Rimana Ash and Maya Romani and Martin Asser and Mary Jeber and so many other people, Mary Khairallah, to make the campus completely tobacco free. And by August 31, 2018, we'd achieved that and set the bar high so that, for example, USJ followed a year later and made its campus smoke free. We also needed to innovate in our curriculum, and as we're continuing to do, as Abla and I and the other deans discussed this morning to make it team-based, educationally relevant, and civically engaged. And this is a young student in agriculture demonstrating to two of our trustees novel methods of developing uh, honey. We also needed to stop asking what kind of a job people were seeking, but what kind of a life. And that's a life that celebrates others, that accepts others, that understands that art and sports and uh, clubs and music are not extra curriculars, but they're co-curriculars. And this is the Nadia al Sheikh uh, with one of our MasterCard and one of our MEPI scholars examining uh, some unusual artwork that was on display at AUB. And finally, to empower tomorrow's leaders, not just look at them as vessels to be filled with uh, great learning, but as my father taught me, to treat them as equals who, who you get to interact with uh, and treat them as young peers because they are going to be tomorrow's citizen leaders. And we need to believe that they will have a better life 
uh, than the one afforded their parents, a more dignified life. To do that, we have to integrate all aspects of this, including athletics, to teach team building and leadership in society, something that's sorely missing from campus uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to ensure that they participate in learning how to elect their own representatives. And this is an example of a student election. Uh, I know many people criticize the student elections at AUB and other campuses because people tend to vote for their political parties. But I actually celebrate that because I want to give you a statistic, which is less than 15%. In the United States, in Europe and other countries, on average, less than 15% of students vote in student elections. At AUB, it fluctuates between 61 and 67%. And if we want people to vote, it starts when they're young. And if they can't vote and accept responsibility for their votes, I don't think we can dream of a better civil society. And finally, we learn how to value them. How do we inspire, engage, and enable them? How do we teach a young nurse leader that she or he are the partners of the physicians and the public health specialists and not the servants and not less prestigious than people in other medical specialties? How do we build an infrastructure where every member of the team can be like this confident young nurse leader is at the Children's Cancer Center uh, of Lebanon and St. Jude's? What's the best infrastructure? To do that, we also always need to keep our eyes on those less fortunate. This is a picture of the uh, team of Hassan Abu Sitta and others helping those less fortunate, in this case, those in, who were wounded by Israeli bombing during the 2014 bombing of Gaza uh, with telemedicine, helping them to treat patients in complex surgical procedures. To do that, I think we have to face our own challenges and look at ourselves, uh, I don't want to say unkindly, but look at ourselves honestly. So when uh, Dean Iman and Wahid and Maha Haidar and then Provost Harajli and others helped obtain the MasterCard grant, helped lead the MasterCard grant, we welcomed a significant cohort of students from Sub-Saharan Africa. And those students said to us that you were not ready for us, and they were right. We have prejudice, we have racism on campus, we have kafala in Lebanon. We have a lot of things that we need to address honestly and face and frankly help eliminate. And I'm happy to say that this year, we're going to move towards a zero tolerance approach to prejudice, to racism across the AUB campus so that everyone feels valued and everyone feels equal and everyone feels embraced. And that also starts with my very first task force, which was the task force to study the lives and careers of women faculty. This is when the report was presented to trustees. This was co-led by Huayda Al-Harithi uh, and uh, of course your uh, former dean who needs no introduction. Uh, I guess some of you may not know who does right, but I suspect all of you do. And this led to an examination of the lives and careers of our women faculty and now to a permanent committee on the lives of women uh, at AUB. Uh, and of course, we celebrate the university for, for seniors. You're a role model because what you're promoting, what you're doing is actually what we really need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the undergraduate degree, even the PhD as a stepping stone in a life forward for leaders who are lifelong learners. And I would argue that if we could convince even the most obdurate of Lebanese and American and European political leaders that they have the opportunity to be lifelong learners, to open up opportunities for them to learn and get better, it would be a nonviolent path forward that we could all embrace. To do that, I think we need to engage in a dialogue, not just with other university presidents, in this case, Chase Robinson, of the City University of New York and Claire Sturck uh, of Emory University, both of whom have retired uh, as university presidents. The average shelf life is four years, so I just exceeded that, perhaps to the surprise of many, if not myself. But we need to look at what an alma mater 2.0 looks like. How do we engage people? 
particularly our students, our lifelong learners, our alumni. And from that perspective, uh, we did something perhaps counterintuitive when many universities are shying away from tenure on the permanent investment in faculty, but we actually managed to restore tenure. And I'm happy to tell you that since we restored it in the last three years, we have actually tenured more than 150 faculty members. Uh, and these faculty members uh, have been tenured at a 75% success rate. So we also have to figure out a way to fund that. And that's by uh, raising funds. And as you can see, we're close to the end of our capital campaign. The academic priorities uh, were almost there with raising funds for them, but our healthcare priorities were some 50 million short and we had to slow down our infrastructure priorities during this campaign. But to do this, I want to think long-term, well after I'm gone, and this is the project that we will be most focused on once the capital campaign is done, which is in addition to the wonderful support we get from MasterCard, ULIP, and others, we want a commitment to create a $100 million fund to bring the best and brightest students from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen to study at AUB and to bond together as leaders so that in steady state, we'll have 100 students uh, across the university who will live together, bond together, and hopefully will be developed to be tomorrow's uh, leaders without having to pay any tuition. To do that, we've engaged, we've communicated. My God, my voice is hoarse for a reason. Um, Actually, it's a clinical reason, but I can say it's always hoarse because of all the speeches and the issues. But we've tried to communicate with our community to reach out and not only to speak, but also to listen. Uh, and listen, we have. We've done that by changing the model of the trustee as not just a donor and the donors in general as not just a donor, but as a partner. So this trustee. Uh, related picture features three people who played a key part of that. This is uh, Talal al-Sha'ir, who along with Dar have given the second most, uh, second largest gift in kind in the university's history. And it's a gift to redevelop AUB's physical master plan, but also its engagement with the community. This is of course my predecessor, the very kind and, and, and uh, sincere Peter Dorman, who also believed that everyone needed to be treated with respect. And this is Ziad Ghazal who recently stepped down as uh, center director and helped secure our first gift for an innovation park, which helps create opportunities for young people to learn how to create their own novel ideas and novel companies. And young people mean students aged 18 to 88 in my opinion. And that led to the uh, record-breaking gift uh, given to us by the late Maroon Saman. And Maroon planted his uh, $50 million plus gift at the faculty because he believed that AUB and the Maroon Saman Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, this is his oldest daughter, Noor, and his wife, Tanya, our trustee, as, as, as well as board chair, Philip Khoury, because what we're celebrating is a faculty that is intended not just to educate the best and the brightest, but to transform society. Maroon believed AUB should be an anchor for a better Lebanon and a better region. And that's our commitment to him that by 2030, we will be firmly anchoring a better tomorrow. So all of these things, the vital, the campus master plan were developed together in a framework so one can inform the other. So these are some of the things we worked on. We renovated Penrose Hall. We built a new Musri Institute of Energy and Natural Resources. We renovated the Agriculture Lecture Hall. Oops, that I need to go back. We also completely renovated Reynolds Hall, which we'd gotten as part of the gift from AUB. All of this uh, prior to the last year. So the question is, how's our strategic plan vital been realigned in response to ongoing crises in Lebanon and the region. Starting with the burning of the forest fires to Thoda, Lebanon's economic catastrophe, COVID-19, and of course the terror of the August 4th uh, Beirut explosion. 
I would say we focused on those programs in terms of their viability and importance. We've leveraged new revenue generating activities such as telemedicine and e-learning. We've identified cost saving measures so we don't bankrupt the university. And we reviewed student outcomes and employability, an area where we rank in the top 50 universities of the world, but also financial papers flow of funds in order to become a leaner, more efficient, and more sustainable university. So despite these many disruptions and instabilities, we're continuing to identify our urgent strategic priorities. And I just spent uh, the morning with the deans and other senior leaders looking at how we prioritize and actualize those. It's important to continue to, to communicate locally uh, and regionally and of course beyond. We have a very gifted faculty and they've been very good at getting out the message of the relevance of AUB. And that relevance and that increased communication, that constant excellence has led to improvements in AUB's rankings. We were essentially unranked in times higher education. We've improved by more than 200 points. And we are now in the top 250 universities in the world consistently, uh, according to QS, the only university in Lebanon and one of only three in the Arab world to be ranked so highly. And we're by far the top ranked university with regard to where our undergraduate and graduate students place professionally and also with regard to their education. But we're also making a different type of difference at AUB. As many of you know, Forbes has a category of 30 under 30 for each part of the world. And this year, AUB uh, became the only university to place three uh, students as entrepreneurs in this area. Natalie Nasruddin, who just graduated with her PhD in biology, Abbas Sidawi, who is a PhD student in engineering, and Kamal, Kamal Webi, who's finishing his undergraduate as a dual economics and political science major, each leading important initiatives in health, uh, in, uh, in autonomous robots, and in representation that are meaningful in Lebanon and the region. And we're also continuing to drive endowments, emergency drives, helping uh, other institutions in Beirut and helping organize things uh, for a national COVID-19 response, including using social media platforms and teaching reports in a $2.5 million US aid grant to link with other institutions, private and public, uh, private uh, through the US aid grant, public through other means, so that we can have a coordinated nationwide COVID-19 response. I think one thing that's probably underrated and underappreciated is just how hard the faculty have worked and how hard the provosts and the deans have worked to ensure that there's teaching support, not only for the students, but also for the faculty to improve our online delivery of our courses and to develop an e-learning strategy. So we have a very ambitious uh, e-learning strategy. Those of you on today, you're part of our target to reach 25,000 distinct online learners by school year 2025-2026 to generate a quarter of our revenue from online programs and to give more and more of our undergraduate education up to a third through distance learning and also to start to get into vocational programs. Many of you know that Lebanon and the Arab world are not well balanced with regard to the number of people who become, uh, who enroll in vocational programs versus those who enroll in academic programs. And we're looking to help the economies of Lebanon and the region to become more sustainable by playing a role in this balance. And to do that, we're not doing it on our own. We've engaged with the 10 other significant uh, private uh, undergraduate uh, and graduate higher education institutions looking for a plan that's sustainable for our students and our alumni. And these uh, university presidents and I represent uh, a group of universities that teaches more than 100,000 students each year. To do that, as I said, we've got to keep expanding our diversity of learners, which we could not do without our wonderful partners in USAID, in the MasterCard Foundation, in the Abdullah Al-Ghurair Foundation, in MEPI's Tomorrow's Leaders, 
and Tomorrow's Leaders Graduate Programs and our Education Leadership in Crisis Program, as well as ULIP, which is somehow not on this picture. So how did we respond in trauma? Well, we treated more than 500 trauma patients, uh, more than 100 of them that we couldn't register that we treated outside on August 4th. We are providing relief through the Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service under the leadership of Rabia Shibli to help rebuild and assess and pick up the, the destruction. We have through the Maroon Saman Faculty of Engineering a post-disaster building structure safety hotline uh, for, and this is a number that responds from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m for Beirut residents, for our experts to go and do an emergency assessment. And finally, through collaboration with other uh, institutions, the other five uh, major teaching hospitals that were damaged in Beirut to help raise funds for them. And I'm happy to say confidentially that we've been able to raise significant awards for uh, four out of the uh, six institutions in, in addition to ourselves by sometimes showing that others such as the Sisters of the Rosary and the St. George's Hospital suffered more damage than we did. Uh, we had our first ever alumni uh, E-class reunion. Here's Abla and, uh, and Iman leading the one for the Faculty of Health Sciences with uh, Imad Balbaki uh, and, and, and others. And finally, uh, focusing on research areas where AUB can excel and be more relevant, be, be more timely. The majority of the CNRSL funding for COVID-19 projects actually went to AUB investigators. 14 out of 29, but most of the funds actually came to AUB researchers, proving our continued excellence and relevance. Uh, and focusing on areas we excel include care delivery, prevention of disease, and uh, education all at once. Finally, we've been under a major effort to streamline me the medical center operations, which has led to these painful uh, layoffs because these are critical resilience and ri risk mitigation strategies. As we go from an AUB that serves more people who have more limited means as opposed to being an attraction during these current times, for patients coming from all over the region. That's still our goal, but we need to serve the community as well as those who would seek our care. To do that, we need to adopt more uh, e-learning platforms. And this is something we've done very well. We're one of only, I think, 30 institutions that Epic cited for excellence in adoption of their uh, methodology and their platforms. This can be Volunteerism can be in so many levels, whether it's Umayyam Sharafi and Joseph Khoury and Brigitte Khoury and others participating in first aid stations for psychological first aid. Uh, something we now know that more than 60%, one statistic I've seen, 60% of Greater Beirut's citizens had some degree of mental health perturbance or trauma as a result of the August 4 explosion. So we're providing more and more of that care or providing physical first aid uh, during the Thawra as thugs were beating up protesters. So this is something we've launched, the Trauma Assessment and Support Clinic free of charge. This has served more than 150 people in the immediate aftermath of uh, August 4th. And it's leading to a sense that AUB must play a role in living through uh, and living up to Martin Luther King's famous saying. Martin Luther King, the great civil rights leader once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. This is a human bridge that includes, among others, many AUB citizens, Tamir Amin, Lina Shwari, uh, uh, as well as our own daughter, Leila Imad Balbaki, and Ali uh, Balbaki and so many others. And if we're going to serve, and if we're going to not stay silent about the things that matter, I think we need to understand who we are. And I think we need to understand the things that 
really we have in common, which are so much more than the things that divide us. And with that, I'd like to end with a couple of quick slides. And this one is a video, a companion to the movie. Aunque lo exiguo de nuestras personalidades, nos impide en estos casos ser voceros de su causa. Creemos, y después de este viaje más firmemente que antes, que la división de América en nacionalidades inciertas e ilusorias es completamente ficticia. Constituimos una sola raza mestiza desde México hasta el estrecho de Magallanes. Así que tratando de librarme de cualquier carga de provincialismo, brindo por Perú y por América Unida. So, before I end, I'm going to say that that's Gael Garcia Bernal playing Ernesto Che Guevara as he discovers the shared bond of the peoples of Latin America. The fact that they have so much in common from the southern tip of the inhabited world all the way up to Mexico, that they are one people. And this was something, whether we agree with his methods or not, that he fought for and believed in his whole life. For me, this is a voyage of self-discovery. It's about what it's like to be Lebanese, Arab, American all at once. And my personal voyage would not have been possible without my wonderful family. And this is, uh, there's been one enormous constant, which is my wife, Lamia, our three kids, my mother and late father, my uncle, who's been to every one of my graduations. And this is us in Petra, discovering what it's like to be called Lebanese and Arabs in January. Uh, I'm grateful to them for their constant love and support of my own personal voyage. If sharing any part of it uh, has been helpful to you, I'm grateful. Thank you for listening to me and I'll take questions. Hopefully I kept my word in finishing under 40 minutes, Adla. Yes, you did, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, we are now open for questions and answers. Uh, feel free to either raise your hand or write the question in the chat. Yeah, okay, so... Uh, so we have we have actually plenty of uh, of, uh, of comments in the chats of thanking you and thanking uh, Dr. Sibai. Um, so there's a question from Sosa Maktabi. Thanks for an enlightening lecture about a promising journey. UFS is now 10 years old. Yes, we are. Uh, can we move a step further and give our members the chance to become more in, more integrated with AUB by giving them the chance to audit some regular classes? Uh, I think everything is a possibility as part of, of fiscal sustainability. I'll, I'll give you, I'll let you in on a little secret. I think the best universities uh, offer some free content. And I'd like to do that at AUB. I'd like to connect people. I'd like to give them an opportunity to see just how wonderful our faculty are and how good these courses are. And as we move more to a diversified world where at least a significant portion of the education is going to be online, uh, I could see that happening. Uh, one of the challenges of AUB in, 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 in all candor is that we're a university currently of 9,500 students and the physical architecture is really probably more for half that volume. So AUB kept adding students, undergraduates and others, and they're all here at the same time. And sadly, I believe COVID-19 ushers in an era uh, of more viral in, you know, infectivity. I do think we're going to be able to offer more courses uh, and more content to our alumni, but I'm hoping that a lot of it will be online, but we'll still be able to open up our campus to you, our students and others once uh, at least this wave of viral challenges is over. Okay. Uh, Dr. Khouri, we have another, uh, we have another question uh, from Huda Halab. Uh, thanks a million, Dr. Khouri. Oops, sorry. 
for this informative and very personalized presentation. What do you think of AB's achievements and research in the region? My feeling a limited knowledge is that we still have a long way to go. So I think in research, as a lifelong researcher, you always have a long way to go. But let's talk impact. Actually, perfectly. remember, AB is a small university. We have some 500 research intensive professorial track faculty, I'd say 550. Uh, and if you look at the metrics, and this is one of the big reasons we climbed the rankings. If you look at our metrics per faculty member, we produce more top tier first and senior authored paper than any other university in the Arab world. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that includes universities in Turkey as well. So the only competitor in high impact papers, the only competitors in high impact papers uh, per faculty member, not number, we, we can't compete with universities that have 20 times our faculty and 100 times our budget. But if you look at the output of people like uh, Abla, uh, like Nadia Al Sheikh, uh, like Ray Brassier, Alan Shahadi, many others, Lara Halawi, Najat Salibi, their output per faculty member in terms of driving research is remarkable. And it's even more remarkable considering that our university budget for research is $2 million of intramural funding. So they, they get 10 times that. They attract $20 million in extramural funding. So I think we're doing very well. Can we get better? Yes, we can. But the rankings suggest we're, we're punching well above our weight. Any more questions? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of comments uh, of, of thanking you. There's one that uh, we would like to also say out loud from Leila Absad. Uh, thank you for such a transparent uh, lecture that links your personal experience to that of AUB, giving an example to all of us to keep us uh, bound to this great university. The frankness of the talk, um, sorry, the frankness of uh, the frankness of the talk, the, fluid, the fluidity will keep the, the trust in this great work that AB is conducting in this area. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Leila. Uh, we're very happy to have that. We have several people actually coming from uh, all around the, the, the region. We have people from uh, from Turkey, Turkey. from uh, from Qatar, and uh, I think we saw somebody from Iraq as well. Um, there's somebody asking, can you have workshops at the UFS? Can you have workshops at the UFS? <laughs> to be considered by the uh, curriculum committee. Yes, exactly. No um, more questions? I think we are done with the with the questions. Um, oh, and we have somebody from Dubai, sorry, as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, before I give the floor to Abla to thank President Khouri and everyone, I just would like to say on behalf of the team that we are all very excited to have a stimulating interactive term uh, so that we remain mentally, physically, and socially engaged while we remain safe and healthy, and while we wait to go back physically to campus. So Abla, the floor is yours. Not bad as the first uh, start, the first one uh, Zoom kind of a, of a session in the UFS. It went, I think, success, very successfully. So I want to really thank you, President Khoury, for this opportunity to share with us your personal I would say you, you mentioned it's it's optimistic and realistic kind of a life journey and what a journey it's a rich journey all, all embedded within within the campus and within the life of AUB. I also want to thank our participants. Uh, really, this is the first uh, we had over I think 90, 95 participants at one point in time. This is even better than our Wednesday seminar, the the scientific Wednesday seminars which we have at AUB at the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, this is the first UFS uh, Zoom experience. I really salute you. I, will, uh, I, won't, I won't call you baby boom, boomers. I want to call you senior Zoomers. Thank you so much for being with us and have a good day. Bye. Congratulations, to seeing you more. Congratulations on your wonderful 10th anniversary. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.